afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. It's great to see all of you here uh, today, and thank you for joining us. My name is Nathan Hiller, and I'm the academic director of the FIU Center for Leadership. The Leadership Research Colloquium, which is why we're here today, was established in 2011 to provide a forum for faculty and other researchers to present new research on leadership to our FIU community. Now that includes students, staff, faculty, as well as folks from the broader community. And it's great to see, I see uh, many familiar faces, it's great to see all of those groups represented here today. I would like to take uh, a minute to briefly introduce uh, each of the three speakers, which I will do then more completely before uh, each of them present with, for us today. Uh, but we have the distinct privilege of Dr. Ju Han being with us here today. And next to him is the soon-to-be Dr. Raquel Asensio. Uh, Raquel is finishing the last touches of her uh, dissertation at Georgia Tech and is, will be moving to Purdue uh, in Indiana shortly. And Dr. Mark McGowan next to her who is uh, at the Stemple School. So I'll introduce them a little bit more before each of them speak, but just to give you a, a sense of who you have uh, here today. So each of these talks does take a different perspective and draws from a different sample, and each has its own implications in the context of leadership. But all of these talks today are centered around the theme of teams and groups, and more specifically, have implications for leading in the context of teams and groups. This work, as well as other work that has been done recently by other scholars across the world, has shown that leadership uh, in the context of teams is not always obvious. So one of the things that we see at the center and one of the misnomers that people have is, oh, this is kind of just common sense. If it was common sense, people would be doing it well. Right? And so we can actually know things through the systematic study of leadership by understanding the context and how that changes the way leadership needs to be enacted slightly differently in a given situation. And there are many different ways that context can play out. And so as a result, then, there's a lot to be understood uh, that set the boundaries and parameters on what makes effective leadership in one context and how that might be different from, uh, from another context. So by studying when, how, and what, and the what of teams and leadership, we can learn more about this field, which then has implications for how we actually push this out. So the goal of today, then, is to take this research and try and get a conversation going among the broader community. So it's a chance for researchers to try to speak the language, right, of, okay, what, what are the implications of this mean, which is something that we that we always want to do. So our first speaker today uh, will be Ju Han. He is an assess assistant professor in the Department of Human Resource Management at Rutgers. He received his PhD uh, two and a half, uh, about two years ago from the University of Maryland. Dr. Han's research interests include leadership, not surprising, right? Employee attitudes, emotions, and performance at multiple, le multiple levels. Uh, his work has been published in several different prestigious outlets, such as the Journal of Applied Psychology and Human Resource Management. He also serves as a reviewer for other journals as people seek to publish their research in those journals. So last year, Dr. Han was the recipient of the, of the 2015 Alva H. Chapman Jr. Outstanding Dissertation Award which is presented by the Center for Leadership. So this is the last in a phase. He found out last August that he was the recipient of this award and received his uh, a preliminary award and today is giving a talk based on that dissertation uh, for which he won this award. And so today is the official trophy day at the end. Uh, but we want to thank him for being here. Um, the award that we sponsor, uh, which uh, Juhan won, is co-sponsored by the Network of Leadership Scholars of the Academy of Management. So there's a group of management scholars that come from all over the world, and we, we co-sponsor 
that award with them. And so the recognition and publicity and the competitive field uh, from which uh, Ju won this award is really sub substantial and significant as we receive uh, applications from all over the world for this award. So his, his dissertation was entitled Admiration or Envy, Effects of LMX We'll, we'll, we'll try and dial this back here in a few minutes, right? Effects of LMX differentiation on group processes and performance under different reward systems. So his talk today examines this topic. Namely, what happens in teams when you have one person who gets special treatment? And when might that special treatment help or at least not hurt the team? by looking at how the team is rewarded versus individuals being rewarded, or both, right? So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Ju Han. Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here, and thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you for the uh, opportunity to share some of the uh, research findings uh, out of my dissertation. And it is truly uh, my great honor. So uh, the study that I'll be presenting is about, uh, is about the leadership uh, in work team context. As Nathan, uh, Nathan briefly mentioned, uh, leader uh, differentially treat each follower. And the question is when and how this differential uh, treatment by leader can you know, either improve or hurt the group functioning and ultimately uh, performance. So uh, as you know, one of the most important jobs as a group leader is to uh, effectively allocate uh, different kinds of work resources across different group members. And work resources may include um, roles, authority, and information, and support, and caring, and something like that. And the thing is that group leaders typically differentially uh, allocate these different kinds of resources to different group members, such that they provide more important role and more resources to some group member, rather than you know, uh, allocating the same kinds of uh, resources you know, uh, to those, uh, all the uh, group members you know, equally. And there might be multiple reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, resources are only limited, so they cannot provide the same thing uh, toward all the group members. Even when you know, research is unlimited, it may not be a good idea to uh, treat uh, each follower in the same way because it may lead to some inefficiency. Right? So therefore, uh, research has found that uh, leaders' uh, treatment of each follower differentially is kind of norm in the work groups. And the thing here is that, yep. Uh, <laughs> So the thing is that uh, uh, leader uh, usually uh, differentially pro uh, allocate different resources by developing a different uh, kind, a different level of uh, exchange relationship with each follower, such that again, as I mentioned, they provide more important role and more resource to some group member, who then you know tend to uh, contribute to the work group more uh, as compared to other members. So uh, in the leadership literature, this is called uh, leader member exchange differentiation. But uh, let me just simply put it as uh, leader differentiation or differentiated, differentiated leadership. Essentially, this is about, again, leaders treating each group member uh, differentially based upon you know, multiple uh, factors. Maybe based upon each follower, uh, each group member's different levels of competency or trustworthiness or just you know, some interpersonal you know, tie or compatibility, something like that. Regardless, they treat each uh, group member differently. So uh, the question then becomes, is this good or bad for the functioning of the work group and ultimately performance? And to this question, I realized that there's some puzzle about the relationship between uh, leader differentiation and work group functioning and group coordination in particular. So on the one hand, it may be good, because if leader differentiates, uh, it can create some hierarchy among group members, such that who, uh, some group members play a more important role, like the one you know, uh, up there, uh, and uh, receive more uh, resource and better treatment. And as a result of this clear hierarchy, uh, it can uh, foster some sense of, a uh, clear sense of uh, division of uh, roles, responsibilities, and direction, and difference. And as you may know, the social hierarchy theory suggests that this, having this kind of clear hierarchy is usually uh, good for uh, group members to coordinate uh, with uh, others. 
So this might be uh, some uh, positive side of leader differentiation for effective group coordination. But on the other hand, it may be bad because it may lead to some relational problems. So especially from the perspective of you know, low status member who receives you know, poor treatment by the leader and who play you know, a minor role and who receive uh, 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 less resource and something like that, they may not feel good about the situation and the leader and their coworkers, which then lead to some hostility or conflict and something like that. And all of this can you know, uh, hurt the way that they coordinate uh, with each other. So I realize that there's just some pros and cons of leader differentiation for uh, leader, uh, the work group coordination and ultimately uh, performance. So the research question then becomes when and how the uh, leader differentiation uh, improve the group coordination and ultimately you know, leading to higher uh, group performance. So this is the overarching uh, research question that I wanted to answer in this uh, study. And in this question, I realized that we need to think about how group members respond to uh, leader differentiation to answer this question. So I realized that uh, if a uh, leader treats each group member differently, then it may foster some comparison process among themselves, such that you know, group members may uh, try to figure out why uh, some group members receive better treatment by the leader, and why not me, and something like that. And uh, this kind of social comparison process uh, can in turn lead to two primary uh, emotional responses of uh, group members. So on the one hand, the, the low status member who receives you know, poor treatment by the leader may admire the high status member such that they provide, you know, uh, they, they accept the differences between them and also they, you know, provide uh, respect and admiration to them. Th th that sounds a good thing, right? But on the other hand, they may envy the high status members. Why, again, they get treated better? So they, they may feel, you know, jealous and envious and inferior and inadequate and something like that. So these two uh, uh, the emotions, like the admiration and envy, are two primary emotional responses. Uh, when they compare with uh, someone else who has uh, uh, better and superior outcomes. And the question then is, uh, when the leader differentiation can lead to uh, more of admiration rather than envy, because uh, as I'll get to later, the admiration tend to create better uh, behavior responses uh, for the group members for higher group performance. And to this question, I argue that it depends on the way that group members are interdependent among each other. So on the one hand, they may be uh, connected interdependently, such that others' outcome may influence my outcome. And this is typically the case where group members receive group incentive pay, where uh, group members receive uh, the same amount of bonus based upon group performance rather than individual performance. In this situation, there are some uh, positive interdependencies among group members. Versus, it is possible that group members may receive, uh, 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 may, uh, may receive individual incentive where they get bonus based upon their individual incentive. So in this situation, the relationship uh, and connection among the group members becomes more of independent rather than uh, interdependent. So uh, with these uh, conceptual backgrounds, I argue that first, if leader differentiates among group members in allocating the work resources, it can actually force, uh, foster two types of uh, group climate. And the one thing is that group climate uh, characterized by you know, group members' mutual uh, uh, admiring. Also, it can lead to uh, uh, a group climate characterized by the group members' mutual uh, envy. And the reason is because if leader differentiates, then there might be just a few uh, group members who receive better treatment. And these, uh, the few select members tend to be a target of the admiration or envy. And this also means that uh, it's likely that the, the work group has greater number of group members who may either admire or envy uh, the few select group members. And there, experience of admiration and envy will be uh, displayed and communicated and spread among, uh, spread among group members as they, as they uh, interact with each other toward the, common, uh, toward the group goals, which then foster uh, the group's overall uh, level of uh, uh, mutual uh, admiration or envy. 
And one thing uh, to note is that it sounds like the admiration and envy are two opposite emotions, such that if you admire someone else, you may less likely to envy others. Uh, in other words, this may be a, a two opposite ends of the same continuum. But research suggests that, interestingly, that's not necessarily the case. So we can envy or admire others uh, at, the, at the same time. So I admire my coworkers, but at the same time, I feel, you know, envy. So uh, that's why I, I first proposed that leader differentiation can lead to, uh, you know, uh, has a potential to foster both of uh, group climate uh, of admiration and envy. Okay, this is a, a baseline hypothesis. And more importantly, I argue that if group members receive group incentive pay, again, uh, where group members receive the same amount of bonus based upon the group bonus, then I argue that the leader differentiation will have stronger impact on admiration climate. And the reason is because admiration is a feeling that usually arises when others' superior outcome does not hurt me. And that's the case under group incentive pay. Because under group incentive pay, the high status member, uh, the fact that there's some high status member means that they receive, uh, they play more important role and they receive more uh, resource. And as a result, they tend to play bigger uh, contribution uh, to the work group. And then the improved group performance by those uh, high status members can be shared among all the group members. So under this situation, uh, the, all the group members will benefit rather than, you know, uh, get hurt from the few high status group members. So that's why I argue that uh, if leader differentiation it may lead to uh, uh, more of admiration climate, uh, especially under uh, group incentive pay rather than individual incentive pay. Further, under group incentive pay, the uh, effects of leader differentiation on envy climate will be uh, weakened. And the reason is because envy is emotion that typically arises when other superior outcome leads, uh, leads me to feel, you know, uh, inadequate and inferior. And under group incentive pay, where again you get uh, the same amount of bonus, then the, no matter how well my co-workers co are treated by the leader, at the end of the day we get the same bonus. So because of that, the differences among group members in terms of the leader treatment may become less salient and less important because they get, you know, similar reward. Uh, versus if workers use individual incentives, then uh, there might be some double differentiation, right? So group leaders, uh, group members will be uh, treated uh, differently by not only the uh, group leaders, but also by the, uh, the incentive page. And research suggests that uh, if you are under a higher quality exchange relationship, they tend to perform better and they tend to receive, you know, uh, more reward under individual incentive page. So in other words, group members will uh, feel more inferior and more inadequate under the individual incentive pay system. So that's why I uh, argue that uh, the leader differentiation uh, will be less likely to uh, lead to the envy climate under group incentive pay. Uh, rather than. And then uh, in turn, uh, the group admiration climate and envy climate will be positively and negatively uh, influence the group coordination. And the reason is because uh, under high level of M climate, there will be a greater number of group members who admire other group members. And research suggests that when, when we feel uh, admiration toward others, we tend to be more helpful and more supportive and, you know, uh, more uh, accepting the, the different others, which then, you know, as you can see, uh, help rather than hurt the group coordination and cooperation versus under high level of envy climate where group members envy each other, then group members may, you know, uh, be less likely to accept different others and sometimes they try to challenge others and undermine others, and all of which can, you know, hurt the way that they co uh, coordinate uh, with each other. Of course, uh, envy has, uh, is kind of complex phenomena where they may not necessarily uh, uh, lead to some negative behaviors. It may actually foster some positive behaviors, but in the context of teams where there's just some, you know, uh, interdependencies in completing their uh, teamworks, I argue that uh, the negative effects of envy will be uh, more pronounced. So anyway, for these reasons, I argue that, you know, envy climate and enemy climate, admiration climate will have some negative and positive relationships with the uh, group coordination. 
And furthermore, I thought that the group in Sintipe may also influence the relationship between uh, admiration and envy climate and group coordination. And the reason is because uh, the group in Sintipe may provide additional incentive for the admiring group members to cooperate and help and support more. Think about the opposite case. Uh, under individual Sintipe, even though I admire my coworkers, I may not always uh, provide support and help my coworkers because uh, we'll be busy in doing our work because we are uh, rewarded based upon uh, individual incentive, right? And that's why I, I suggest that the group admiration climate will lead to higher, uh, a better coordinate group coordination, uh, especially under uh, group incentive pay rather than individual incentive pay. And as for the envy climate and uh, group coordination, if group members are uh, receive group incentive pay, then uh, they may have less incentive for uh, to uh, challenge and undermine undermine the high status group member. Because under group incentive pay, if they undermine other uh, high status members and as a, as a result, it is possible that group performance, entire group performance may uh, may suffer. Then they get you know paid less. So. Even though I envy others, I may have less reason to do that you know, if I can benefit from you know, high status group member under group incentive pay. And that's why uh, I argue that the group incentive pay may uh, buffer the negative effects of envy climate on group coordination. And lastly, as you can see, uh, group coordination is one of the most important group process variable leading to higher group performance. So this is my uh, overall uh, theoretical model. And to test this model, I collected data from sales groups in a large uh, home, home appliance retailer in China. And this company is a pretty big one, belonging to uh, Fortune 500. And also, I think this company is a, a Chinese version of um, the Best Buy. So, and I, I collected data uh, from 828 teams and from a little bit more than 3,000 uh, team members. And the company has you know, uh, lots of uh, stores all across the mainland China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And I used pretty much all the established measures to measure all the variables. And the group performance was uh, actual sales record of each sales group. And as a result of uh, different kinds of analysis, I found two important things. One, under group incentive pay, the leader differentiation positively influenced group admiration climate, which then positively influenced group coordination and then ultimately group performance. So this is consistent with my hypothesis, and this is one important thing. And secondly, I found that the group incentive pay could also buffer the negative effects of envy climate on group coordination. So let me give you a little bit more details of the findings. So uh, under group incentive pay condition, as you can see here, the relationship between leader differentiation and admiration climate was positive, but it was not the case under individual incentives. And also, as I mentioned about the buffering effects of group incentive, the relationship between uh, group envy climate and coordination was uh, slightly positive, although not, not significant statistically under group incentive pay. Uh, however, under individual incentive pay, there was a significant negative relationship between envy climate and coordination. So this is a uh, quick summary of the finding. So, so what's the implication? So going back to my uh, uh, earlier original question of when and how the group, group leaders can improve the uh, the group coordination and ultimately group performance. So my answer from this study would be, it is when leader uh, differentiation is combined with a you know, more integrated uh, group incentive pay system. In other words, uh, if leader differentiates, then the reward system should integrate them rather than you know, further differentiate them. So uh, differentiation and integration should coexist in order to foster group admiration climate and ultimately higher performance. And also, another quick implication is that usually uh, leadership research focuses on um, you know, uh, leaders' individual traits or the characteristic of the followers in, uh, for the leaders to determine the appropriate leadership style uh, in the work group context. But uh, the finding in this study shows that leaders need to uh, attend to the nature of their uh, context as well, especially the incentive pay design. So because as you have seen, depending on the nature of the group in, uh, incentive design, the effect of uh, leader differentiation was uh, very significantly. So that's another, I uh, think, uh, important implication. And lastly, 
Uh, as you have seen, I found significant effects of admiration and ambient climate on group coordination and ultimately performance. So in other words, the emotion uh, among group members matter. Right? So group leaders need to uh, proactively observe and assess and uh, manage uh, the way that group members feel uh, each other. So like they may uh, be a role model to uh, provide appreciation and admiration and respect to the higher achievers to foster the admiration climate. But at the same time, they may need to be cautious about, you know, uh, against providing you know, excessive public, you know, praise to some higher achievers because it may invite some envy from other group members. So in other words, I think there are just some uh, roles that leaders need to play in fostering this uh, emotion. Climate, uh, which has uh, uh, potential to impact uh, their uh, actual performance. So this is, uh, these are some primary implications of my study. And thank you very much again for the opportunity. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you, Dr. Han, for that talk. So this question really sits at the intersection of, of something that a lot of organizations deal with, right? They're getting people more and more into teams, right? So people are, are, are told and they're set up to say, you need to do this collaboratively. And oftentimes that's the only way things can get done, particularly when, it's, when you're doing complex kinds of work. But here's what's interesting is that a lot of organizations are only rewarding individual performance, right? So we want you to work like a team, but I'm only measuring your performance and that's how you're going to be rewarded. And so then on the other extreme, which you could have is to say, well, it all depends how the team does and your pay or whatever your uh, total rewards, right, um, come from what the team is doing on, on the other hand. And you wouldn't want that, right? And so there's this struggle of what's the appropriate amount to incentivize both individual and team performance. And then, so this study kind of sits at the intersection of that, as well as another question, which you often, or another phenomenon that you often see, which is leaders don't treat everyone the same. And is that okay? And can that be actually beneficial? If you're treating people differently and giving them more resources because they're more competent, and at the same time, if you are rewarding the team performance, you're providing a model for people to say, oh, well, maybe that person doing a, you know, getting the extra resource is actually helping us all because it's helping our team be more effective if they're competent. And so you, you don't get that envy, right, when people see, oh, we're all in this together, right? But if you say that you're, uh, you know, if you're not all this in, in this together, if you incentivize individual performance, and you treat people differently, that's really the worst. I think that was the worst case scenario, right? And a lot of times that often happens. So it was a neat study that, you know, intersected this idea of pay, of how we pay, how that sets a really important context for how this leadership phenomenon of do you treat everyone the same or not, which often happens, how, whether or not that, how that affects your group depends on the pay, Right. So how you treat people and what effect it has depends on how the organization and or you are setting the pay. And I think it, it helps bring this complexity to the idea of the situation matters. And that includes, in this case, how people are rewarded. So thank you. So uh, next we have uh, soon to be, again, as I mentioned, Dr. Raquel Asensio. She can uh, only, uh, it, it can't come soon enough. For those of you who've been involved or seen people involved in a dissertation process, it's a, it can be a, a, a nightmare in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but she's uh, going to be defending successfully. So um, Raquel is currently a PhD student at Georgia Tech. And she has received the Goizueta, I don't know if I'm saying it right, um, fellowship uh, while she was there, which is a prestigious fellowship. She sits on the, an advisory board for in-group and currently mentors uh, also uh, students' groups on campus in the context of leadership. And so she will be moving in July to uh, join the Cranert School of Business at Purdue University. So we're glad to have her here, Dr. Er, soon to be Dr. Asensio. 
great. Thank you um, so much for coming. I have no numbers to show you today, but what I am going to talk about is um, some work with NASA that we have going on. And um, we're just kind of starting this beast, so I'm going to share a little bit about what's going on. In 2015, NASA released a report uh, about their journey to Mars. In the report, they described the steps that they're taking towards the ultimate goal of reaching Mars, a journey that is not just to visit, but to stay, which sounds a little bit scary. And so in the next few decades, NASA is going to take the steps towards establishing a sustainable human presence on Mars. Uh, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a lot of work being done to develop the tools, the systems, and the procedures needed to get people on Mars. But while NASA is extremely concerned with the infrastructure surrounding such a mission, there's one very important component to all of this, people. There's a significant leadership problem on this mission. So let me paint this picture for you a little bit. The Mars mission is a long distance space exploration or LDSC mission as they call it and it's going to present some really difficult challenges. The first of which is its long duration. Uh, the crew is going to be gone for about 30 months and traveling over 54 million kilometers away. I'm not used to PCs, I apologize. And show of hands if you've seen The Martian, recent movie. Oh, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's a good movie. So what I'm showing here is the Martian's Aries. Look at this ship. <laughs> there is a whole room. There's a whole scene where all you see is one treadmill in a, in a whole entire room. So if you've seen the movie, you have this vision of lots of space for work and play. But guess what? NASA says this kind of shuttle is a no-go for the Mars mission. In fact, um, our astronauts are going to be cozy inside. Um, <laughs> Orion, which is a lot smaller, the size of a prison cell even. So this is going to be a tight and long journey for these guys. Another major challenge is the isolation. So on the Earth side of the mission, we have 21st century technology, right? We can communicate just like you do today. Everybody's got a phone. Uh, but between the ground control and the crew, there's going to be about a 20-minute delay. So if something goes wrong with the crew, it's going to be 20 minutes before anyone on Earth even knows what's going on. And a lot can really happen in that time. The crew's going to have to act with a level of autonomy that NASA is not used to giving. Further, as the report states, the Mars mission will be a collaborative effort among NASA and its partners. So it's not just our mission, right? This is a interdisciplinary, interagency, and international collaboration. Dealing with just one of these things is difficult. Dealing with all of these things simultaneously is going to be a little bit problematic, to say the least. So what's clear is that beyond generating innovations in engineering, biology, and medicine, NASA is looking for innovations in organizing teams of people. Leadership is no doubt going to play a really huge role here on this mission to Mars. Our field has made really great progress in leadership research, but this mission is going to require us to solve some new problems and to think about leadership in ways that we haven't exactly been thinking about leadership in order to fill this gap. So today what I'm going to do is take leadership and put it in the context of a Mars mission. In my discussion, I'm going to borrow some quotes from NASA personnel that were interviewed by my own team as well as others to give you a sense of the issues as described by the people who are really in the thick of it. So first I want to address what we know. There are things that have been established in the literature about what makes a good leader. Some of the most widely recognized and supported attributes that contribute to successful leadership include intelligence, creativity, and experience. But that's just the starting point. Leaders also need things like motivation, charisma, self-confidence, and adaptability to lead effectively. And also, there are attributes that contribute to effective leadership relations like emotional stability and empathy. And this can be really important in space exploration. One interviewee stated, there was one mission in particular where the crew had difficulty opening a drawer and the ground kept telling them they were doing it wrong. Finally, the crew had to take pictures to show what was wrong with the drawer. The people who get frustrated with the ground get frustrated with the mission. So how do you teach the ground that some of these things are more difficult than expected? The ground here is ground control. Attributes like empathy can help leaders to be effective in high-stress situations such as space exploration. It helps people to understand, okay, 
opening a drawer is something that's very simple here on Earth, but maybe not as, in, not as easy up in space. We also know that leaders possess skills that make them effective. Expertise is critical. Leaders have to possess the requisite knowledge to lead in any kind of context. A former flight director noted, the most effective astronauts that I've interacted with have been really experienced good Capcoms. As an aside, a Capcom is a, or capsule communicator is the person solely responsible for communicating with the crew um, from mission control. The astronauts that have been a pain on, in orbit have never been a Capcom. Their assignments never led them to work real-time operations in mission control. Leaders also need good social skills to effectively connect with others, and they need to be equipped to assess and solve problems. This all seems kind of familiar, intuitive. We also know about what leaders do. Results from the Ohio State studies in, in the 1940s gave us two main behaviors that leaders, leaders engage in, and we still talk about these somewhat today. The first is consideration, which involves empowering others, providing feedback, and establishing trust. And the second is initiating structure, and this involves defining and organizing roles, uh, setting the direction for goal accomplishment, establishing clear communication channels. At NASA, Setting the structure is paramount so that everyone knows where they're needed. One astronaut stated, the commander tried to divide the task equitably. Four of us were doing spacewalks and the fifth did the robotic arm operation. Everybody had some significant role to play in the mission and the performance on these tasks was critical to mission success. Leaders must provide structure for their subordinates. We also know what makes a good follower and this is important. Powerful followers are necessary to support powerful leaders. And we know that effective followers are engaged, really thorough in their work, they are really independent thinkers, and followers are always going to be important. But at NASA, it's interesting because the followers are high-level experts in their domains. And so follower expertise plays a really important role in setting the direction and mission planning. It's a leader's job to leverage that expertise in order to accomplish the goals. Uh, one person noted, it's easy to come up with a plan when you are the expert in that area, but you may not have the technical expertise in certain areas. That means you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of yourself and others. So it's important for leaders to kind of establish that, okay, what do I know? What do other people know? How can we use this? Also very important is that leadership is often shared, shifting from one person to another depending on who has the expertise necessary for that particular task. And so it's important that leaders also be good followers. And at NASA, they particularly look for this. Uh, one of our interviewees said, one of the things we're interested in is how can you be competitive but still be a good follower? And some can't give up being the leader. We're looking at candidates' communication style, leadership, followership, and how good of a team player they are. And finally, we also have a large literature on leadership in teams. And what we know in this area is really relevant to the Mars mission because on this mission, Leaders will be leading teams of people. The perspective of functional leadership is that a leader's role is to do whatever needs to be done for the team. That sounds pretty broad. But team members need to coordinate, and their inability to integrate their contributions can sink the team. And so a leader needs to integrate and synchronize the inputs of their team members in order to provide the way forward and help set up the team for success. Team leadership is not about influencing a group of subordinates. It's about supporting team interactions and coordination. So there's quite a bit that we already know that can help us, um, that we can apply in a Mars mission. But there's some new challenges here. And we need to address leadership in this particular uh, context. When my team conducted interviews with NASA personnel, we were very quickly actually made aware of two important aspects of the Mars mission collaboration. The first is that leaders have to manage teams that are part of larger systems of teams. So in the same way that members of a team are reliant on one another to achieve a team goal, teams that are part of a system are reliant on other teams in order to achieve some overarching goal. We call these multi-team systems and more formally define them as two or more teams working interdependently towards an overarching goal, MTSs for short. The Mars mission is one large, complicated MTS. I'll explain. There are many different teams on Earth, and it starts with two ground control centers. We have NASA and then also the Russian Space Agency. 
Then there are mission planning teams, vehicle design teams, and a lot of backroom teams that sort of make it all come together and happen. In addition to these teams, there are scores of science teams that plan and help execute different experiments before and during the mission. And then finally, we can't forget the crew that's going to travel from Earth to Mars. What makes an MTS such as this one unique from just a really large team is that in an MTS, we have component teams, each with their own set of goals, and they have to figure out how to work effectively with each other in an effort to achieve some overarching goal that they all have a stake in. There's a level of mutual reliance on other teams, and it's really important that these collaborations go smoothly. <laughs> um, one interview he stated, the crew depends on the ground to analyze the data and to tell them what they need to know to execute the missions. From liftoff to landing, they rely on the ground to be able to execute the flight. So you can see some of this mutual reliance here in this statement. I'm going to contextualize leadership in a multi-team system. How do we lead a multi-team system? Well, we can't just rely on research that has only considered leadership in a single team because there's so much collaboration that happens between team boundaries. We see the makings of this in a Mars mission, but we have also seen it before. Kennedy's speech to Congress in 1962 sparked unprecedented innovation and design advancement to get us to the moon. Then just a short time later in 1969, the Apollo 11 crew made their historic landing. History will always remember and romanticize Kennedy's leadership, but this mission took a system of leadership. Within the moon mission, there were many scientists, engineers, administrators, and government officials that led the MTS that got us to the moon. In a multi-team system, leaders must work together between team boundaries in order to integrate the efforts of multiple teams. Leaders cannot simply focus on their own team goals. Consider the statement by a former flight director. You can't let anyone do what is best for their team at the expense of another team. You can have subteams, but nothing should be done in service of subteams without consideration of the big overall team. Everyone has a common goal, one common mission. This flight director is referring to the big team, but is really talking about a multi-team system here. An MTS made up, com made up of component teams that work together to achieve their common goal. And so leading an MTS is about managing relations between different groups. But there's a big challenge here, as if it couldn't get more complicated. Building a strong team is part of a leader's job. Research would tell us, yes, this is an important function of a leader, to make a team cohesive and strong. But there are some consequences when a team becomes too cohesive or too enclosed. There's a natural human tendency. We like to classify people and things into in-group and out-group. And if a team becomes too cohesive, there's a chance that they're going to shut off those external interactions that are really important or, you know, stop communicating, coordinating with other teams in the MTS. And alternatively, another complication, teams that engage in too many interactions across their teams may become highly assimilated to the MTS and risk losing their team identity. The hallmark of a multi-team system is that it's composed of entitative teams. These are unique entities with their own skill sets that contribute to an overarching problem, but they also have team goals that they need to achieve. And so it's important that the teams remain teams, but still collaborate with the system. And so this is the challenge of MTS leadership, is to foster the development of a strong team and also build a well-coordinated MTS. The second thing that we realize is that leaders have to manage individuals that are members of more than one team at a time. This is known as multi-teaming and is defined as an individual's participation in multiple work teams. In the Mars mission, individuals are going to be wearing multiple hats. So an astronaut is part of the crew, but might also be on a team, um, coordinating with a team on Earth that's planning some experiments. As one astronaut put it, there's overlap in these teams. Just because you're in one team doesn't mean you can't be a part of other teams. Generally, participation in multiple teams provides access to knowledge through direct and indirect connections. So people can have direct access to knowledge and information through their own team memberships and also have access to knowledge and information through their teammates' multiple team memberships. And so there's incentives for people to be part of more than just one group at a time. However, 
In multi-teaming, members have to allocate their time and their attention and manage the flow of information across all of the teams that they're part of. And this can be problematic because we're human beings and we have limited resources to devote across all these tasks. But while challenging, multi-teaming is inevitable in a lot of cases. And so it's important to consider leadership in the context of multi-teaming. How do we lead people that are in multiple teams? There's almost no research in this area uh, to inform us of what this looks like. And so we have more questions than answers, but this is a really big opportunity for researchers. Leaders on the Mars mission will have to lead people across multiple teams. And this is not how we're used to thinking about leadership. We've been asking, how does a leader impact the performance of a single team? But in a multi-teaming context, we can't continue to wonder how to enable the success of just one team. We need to instead be thinking about an ecosystem of teams. Leaders have to lead across teams that are all interconnected and overlapping, and we want to enable the success of all of these teams. And so how do we? How do we enable the success of an ecosystem of teams? That does not sound easy. Um, leaders have to determine how to access resources needed for the success of their teams and do so while balancing uh, their efforts across all of these multiple memberships. And the key consideration here is that it's not just the leaders who are on multiple teams, but the team members also have multiple memberships. And so leaders have to consider the embeddedness of their members in this entire ecosystem. In a high stakes mission, it's going to be really important. The success of every team matters. Mars is such a high stakes mission. So leading the journey to Mars requires us to apply what we already know about leadership and leadership in teams. But that's only a small part. Teams are so often not only responsible for achieving their own goals, but also work interdependently with other teams. And so we have to think about leadership in multi-team systems. And additionally, team members often belong to multiple teams at once. And so leaders must lead people that work across multiple teams. Now, I've said all this, and these are the problems that NASA is requiring us to solve. We're going to see a lot happening in the coming years related to this area. But what about us? How many of us experience this very, these very issues in our own organizations? Solving these problems not only fulfills a need for space exploration, but can really help improve work here on Earth. More and more, we find that teams and organizations are working interdependently to accomplish collective goals. New product development multi-university collaborations, for those of you who are professors in the room, and also cybersecurity. These are just examples of issues that are tackled not by a single team, but multiple teams, multi-team systems. And we also ex uh, regularly experience multi-teaming at work. So take this example from uh, Google Teams. An individual may start their day collaborating with a team of engineers, then send emails to colleagues about marketing a new product, then jump on a conference call to plan a new product line, and end the day with the party planning committee. This is a little bit more like how we experience work on a daily basis, at least it is for me. And so the average employee has a lot to gain from research related to a Mars mission. So what's the way forward for advancing research on leadership? Well, first, I would argue, we need to expand research on leadership in multi-team system and multi-teaming contexts. Research on leadership in these contexts has a lot to offer in two areas, so we can kill two birds with one stone, if you allow me that cliche. Uh, we need this research in order to facilitate a manned mission to Mars, but we also need this research to facilitate our own collaborations in general work contexts. We have a lot to do and a lot to gain in this research, and there's already several teams in place that have answered NASA's call to help them with their leadership challenge, and that is because leadership Research on leadership that is out of this world is definitely going to impact the leadership that's within it. And with that, I want to thank our sponsors and collaborators, and thank you. How, how great to be doing a project with such impact. What do you do today? I'm just helping build teams that are going to Mars. <laughs> just an average day. Um, it's certainly exciting work. As with our next speaker, thinking about the context, the important context in which uh, they operate and which they're studying and also doing some of their work. Um, so thank you, Raquel, for that, uh, for that talk. I'm, I, this idea of a multi-team system takes a little bit to get your head around, um, but, or it did for me. 
<laughs> I won't speak for you, but the first time I heard this, I remember thinking, wait, what? Okay, so what does this mean? I think one of the one of the neatest implications, or one way that's also helpful to think about this, is this idea of a lot of times organizations have departments, right? Your department is a team. You have to do things, but there's often a bigger mission of the organization that needs to be met. Uh, how many of you have been in departments or groups at work that are really cohesive and tight? It's not always a good thing, right? That's what, that's what this brings up, right? Is that because if your work then as a team is to interface with others and play well in support of a larger mission, you're not going to be able to do that well if you're too cohesive, right? But at the same time, you don't want to, you need to have some identity as a group, right? So there's really interesting research going on as it relates to how much of an identity and how cohesive do you want your team to be? When you're part of a multi-team system, the answer is a moderate amount. You want to have some group identity, but you want to make sure that's connected to the broader identity. But having a really strong group identity can be a highly negative thing, which I think is really kind of fascinating because we don't think of it that way, right? We think cohesive teams are good. And there's other evidence also to suggest that cohesive teams can, can do really great because they all go down the drain singing together and hugging. But, uh, you know, no, no one has noticed that there's a fire or, no, you know, no one has noticed what's, uh, uh, what's happening or, there, or really bad performance norms can, can happen in a really cohesive team. So it's my privilege to introduce to you our final speaker today, Dr. Mark McGowan. He is currently accepted a role as interim dean for academic affairs. And he has uh, been a professor since 2002, one at FIU, and uh, he's in the Robert Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work. Dr. McGowan's research interests include group work in the areas of substance abuse, mental health, and social well-being, and of particular note for today's talk, resilience. He is the author of the book, Guide to Evidence-Based Group Work, and co-author of Group Work Research, and is co-editor of two other books. Mark received a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship in 2012-13 to conduct work at the University of Edinburgh. He's a licensed therapist and supervisor of therapist trainees and has significant clinical experience dealing with those affected by disasters. He currently serves as a mental health, a mental and behavioral health specialist with federal, state, and local government disaster response teams, thus the uniform and which is the setting for the research that he will be discussing today. So today, Dr. McGowan will be speaking about building resilient disaster response teams and effective teamwork. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me. Wel join me in welcoming Dr. Mark McGowan. I just have a correction. I'm, I'm the interim associate dean the reason I say that is because if the dean heard that I was the, <laughs> I won't be interim anything any, any, for very long. So, but, but thank you for that. Um, and it's not Halloween. I'm wearing this because it's topical uh, to the presentation I have to do. But um, so w the first presentation was very uh, admirable. It had concepts of admiration in it, which is great. And the second was out of out of this world, really. <laughs> So now my presentation's a disaster. <laughs> or at least I'm going to try and avoid that. Um, so this is a little bit about building resilient disaster response teams, uh, competencies for effective teamwork. So this presentation is more about a wet, wet your appetite um, kind of endeavor. I don't have all the answers. This is sort of at the very beginning of a journey. And um, it's a journey with... Um, uh, with my own observations as a as a team member, but uh, on on a number of different um, contact in a number of different contexts, but also as an academic, um, I'm also working uh, with um, or my doctoral students working with me on this project, Barry Lattice, who I'd like to ac acknowledge as well. I don't think he's here because he's taking statistics right now where he should be. So um, I thought I'd start with this. So 
So the rat says, what do you have in what, what do you have there, rat? Emergency preparedness kit. It's so that we can be ready for natural disasters and stuff. Uh, well, what's in it? Beer and hot dogs. So we're ready for everything or anything. <laughs> so the question to you is, what's in your preparedness kit? So the other message here is we've had a lull in terms of disasters, and, and it's always good to be mindful of how we're prepared both uh, personally and in, in the group level and also the uh, community level. So the aim that I have in the, in the little bit of time that I have to, to talk here is that um, effective teamwork is critical for disaster medical assistance teams and that focus on preserving life and limb while maintaining mental health among responders. Um, so the literature is rich about effective teamwork in general, and there's probably people here written in that area. So I'd like to bend your ear at some point about how that may apply or tease you to think about how that literature may apply to working in the kind of teams that I'll be talking about momentarily. Um, so there's little guidance about how team leaders uh, or leaders can build resilience DMAT teams. I'll tell you what those are in a moment. So we're gonna, I'm going to share a little bit about what disaster response, about disaster response teams um, and some of the competencies that can make them resilient based on, on, I would say, quite an extensive lit review. But it's going to be a little cryptic because we don't have time to go into the full model. I'll show you what the model is. Um, but first, I'll let you know what, what, um, what the DMAT teams are part of. It's the National Disaster Medical System, the NDMS, which your tax money supports. And by the way, I have to say this. Um, I'm not representing the federal government right now. This is a disclaimer. <laughs> These are my own personal opinions and based on my uh, observations uh, and, and my own research. So end of disclaimer. <laughs> so we respond to natural disasters, technological or man-made disasters, uh, acts of random or acts and or potential acts of terrorism, and public health emergencies. What is the DMAT team in particular? That's one of the nine teams that respond to, uh, that could be uh, responding to natural disasters or the other disaster I just showed you. Uh, other teams include the the veterinary teams, and it's nice to know that there's, there's support for our animals in disasters, but also mortuary teams, unfortunately, but there has to be um, support for that too. So these are medical personnel deployed for two weeks to provide care during a disaster, and it's a rapid response element that can be mobilized quickly until the, the uh, resources in the community are back, back in order. So we deploy to disaster sites with enough supplies um, to sustain for at least three days, and, and we're on call periodically throughout the year, and we're supposed to move in you know, 24 to 48 hours or so to wherever it is. My, um, the deployed team, the teams consist of the following, depending on the size of the disaster. So we've got a type one, type two, and type three team. Now the South Florida team is uh, a type one team, but it depends on the kind of disaster and what response is needed as to which one goes. Now my role is I'm a licensed mental health therapist, so if you look down at the bottom of the list, almost, uh, is the credentialed behavioral health person. And so there's one of those for these 48 team, 48 member teams and one of those for the 36 member teams and zero of those for the tw 24 member teams, type three teams. Most of them are the um, physicians and nurses and medical personnel who are attending to, you know, legitimate medical issues. And my role or our role is to tend both to the trauma of the victims, but actually they come and go. So who do you think our other client might be? The other people on the list. <laughs> now, I hope no one else is on that list here, but because um, uh, that's supposed to be a secret. Um, when you're deployed, you're supposed to do your job, and, and, and um, it's sometimes difficult to work um, uh, in that mental health realm or be open about it with paramedics. And some of you are maybe are paramedics or, or firefighters or are married to one, partnered with one, whatever, friends with one. And, um, and that's always a challenge. They face very adverse situations, um, and they're having to deal with it a lot of times without adequate mental health support. So we're there also for them. Um, to help, and that's kind of part of what my presentation is about, and that's building resilience, and resilience at different levels. Um, so I talk about individual resilience there, and there's a definition there. I've been looking at both individual resilience and team resilience, and it's, you know, this resilience is a dynamic process. It's not just something that you, you have in you, but also uh, based on, 
on, on, on resources outside of you as well. And then I don't want to neglect community resilience, which I put down there, and that's a part of the presentation I won't have time really to deal with uh, when, I'll, when I'll show you the, the framework that I'm using. We also talk about competencies, and, and there's a, just a general definition of competencies. Um, but here's two words that um, you may or may not be familiar with. We talk about sort of technical competencies on a team like this. So we're hired because we're supposed to know what we're doing in terms of our own professional role. Um, the physician knows what they're doing. The, the, the mental health person is credentialed as a licensed mental health. They know what they're doing. Um, so we assume that's a given. And so we're not talking about competencies about those, although there is some things that have been written about those. And, and I've got three references there. And I have a reference list over here for anyone who wants to follow up on any of this information. Um, but what we're really talking about are the non-technical or non-clinical competencies, and that's the combination of cognitive and social skills which complement knowledge and technical skills and contribute to safe performance. I would broaden that not just to safe performance, but also to um, being able to, to manage um, life on, on a team and on a deployment, on a, on a two-week uh, deployment. So I'm talking about non-technical competencies. And uh, the ecological framework is really important. It was already brought up. Um, so the model I have here, which is sort of whet your appetite, um, we can't go into all of this, but the ecological perspective, if you start talking about that, then you're required to talk just beyond the individual. Uh, we're looking at the individual in the context. So what I'm going to be focusing on uh, is more, more of the microsystems, the individual, like the member and the leader, and, and at the team level. I put that under micro as well. Some people might put that under mezzo, but I put it under micro. Um, mezzo systems are organization and community. And then the macro system, societal and global. And all these contribute to the functioning of the teams. And there's literature on all of those, which I don't have time really to, to cover. So I magically make those disappear. Um, but I have references uh, on those if you want to pursue them or my email later. that You can see how this ends up. It's, so that's one part of the model, the ecological part. The other one is a developmental model. So the team moves through developmental stages over time. Uh, there's a pre-deployment stage before you actually go. People call that mitigation stage, preparedness stage, planning stage. Um, it could also be seen as a moderator of outcomes if, you, if you're a researcher. So the kind of skills and the, and the resilience I can build before I go are going to control whether I'm going to be um, losing it when I'm out there, if you want to look at it from a perspective of mental health. Then there's a deployment phase, which is the acute phase of support, uh, that's response and relief, or long-term phase of support, which is the re recovery. So our teams usually just focus on response and relief, not long-term recovery, because you're only there for a couple of weeks. And that you could see it as a mediator's outcomes if you're research-minded. And then post-deployment, you come back, and that's a ref reflection process. So this also cycles around. Um, and so you, you kind of go back and, and build, back, build that back into. So that's a taste of the sort of the, the larger model that we've been looking and compiling. But my little presentation here is only going to focus on one part of, of that. We don't have time to go through the, the stages process that each of these micro areas that are going to be looking at. But um, so I'm going to give you a, a, a quick a taste of that. Um, I did mention the outcomes or part of um, the process are outcomes, right? So the individual outcomes at the micro level include obviously patients. You know, the, the patients have to be well, and they have to be satisfied with the services that we're, we're giving them in these, in these um, somewhat austere environments. Um, but also the mental health of responders I mentioned. So we talk about increasing compassion satisfaction um, and decreasing compassion fatigue. Those are terms that have been used. Some people use the term emotional labor in, say, public administration, nursing. Um, it's funny, we use different terms for similar things. <laughs> um, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about that after. And so at, the, res at the, the team level, the resilience outcomes could be patient treatment outcomes as an aggregate, a sense of fulfillment as a team, um, and a, a collective sense of compassion, satisfaction, that we all did good uh, for people, you know. Um, so now let me dig into sort of the... The, the guts, if I can use that metaphor, because we're talking about medical things, um, uh, the micro-competencies micro of all members. So I have a couple slides here that just, um, and I, I'm happy to send any of these to, 
to you, but I've got some parts of that that are bolded that I might just pick up on. These are based on the lit review. What are some of the individual competencies of, uh, of disaster members? Now, there's lots of literature out there about competencies of team members and tests of that, but we were looking for specific uh, things that, that focused on, on disaster response, things, uh, uh, characteristics are involved with, with these, um, these deployed teams. In, in, in a short environment, a short time frame. So um, uh, health resilience is important, phys being physically capable of, of being deployed. Um, also, the, the uh, preparation psychologically is important, having some sense of where you are. And what I've been doing is I've been developing a measure that people could use to assess where their level is. It's, it's actually, I didn't, met, I'm, I put it online essentially is what I'm doing. Um, it's not ready to be deployed yet, but um, it's essentially um, uh, based on an existing measure so that people could actually know if they're well prepared for that. There's other things up there that um, relate to cognitive problem solving, decision making, like being decisive, courage to act and make wise decisions, uh, mental organization can focus and concentrate. You've got things happening pretty quickly. Uh, they come quickly and fast and, and heavy, um, and you've got to be, you've got to be able to work with that. Then there's some other uh, micro competencies again for, for individuals, interpersonal skills, uh, so able and willing to communicate with different types of people from diverse backgrounds and cultures. I want to bring that up because you're going into a situation in which um, it may not be familiar to you and they may not be familiar with you. So that cultural sensitivity and awareness, which is often not taught and, uh, and, uh, and understood and, and displayed is important. Team mindedness. Having a mind about teams um, is important. So keeping in mind the larger purpose of the team's work, it's not all about you, valuing the respective roles, expertise, and contributions of other disciplines that you're working with. So I'm working with physicians, EMTs, and all that. Highly respect them and their work, uh, and I would expect the same from them. And we always, well, not always, we, we often will work in a, an austere environment. So you've got to be uh, able to improvise and be flexible and adaptive uh, and, and innovate. And some of you may have been in those kind of environments. So if you're a camper <laughs> in the wilderness, you're, you'd be great for this job. Um, we, we did something, we, we did a, a drill in the Everglades. It was called austere environment drill. And so we were out there for um, two days um, getting eaten by mosquitoes. Um, we brought our own food. We didn't kill any animals to eat there. Um, and then. So moving from the individual, then there's the leaders, and these are some other, these are some just some ca uh, characteristics of, of of disaster medical response leaders, team leaders that are that have been highlighted. Again, maybe some overlap with with other leaders, but lending a vision, for example, good leaders get subordinates to buy into the vision and share it. That's important. Um, and then different leadership styles um, uh, coordinating their teams in a manner where compassion fatigue is averted and are effectively dealt with. That's one of the message I'd like to kind of drive home here is that compassion fatigue, the mental health of the members needs to be very important in, in the leader's minds, which is often neglected in, in situations. So now moving to the team level, um, composition is important. Um, selection should not be based entirely on skills. Fitting into a team and being able to carry out the work required in the field is more desirable. And to have an experience mix is good. So the DMAT teams are sometimes, you want to have a mix of novices with experienced people to be able to share that um, and to have some mentoring involved there. And our, our team is actually pretty good about that. Um, and then the roles. The roles, as you understand the concept of roles, it's not just that I, this is my role as a mental health therapist. That's useless unless other people affirm that. So it's a dynamic process in terms of your role. You can come in as being the the genius, or you're thinking you're the genius, or your, sat, your, your, your grades show that. But if you sit down, you may have had that experience. Maybe you're one of those geniuses. No one, no one recognizes you as a genius. <laughs> so it's only until that, that connects that your role is affirmed. <laughs> so um, it's, Im it's important um, to have a clear understanding of each member's roles and responsibilities and affirm that to them so that they can function well in what they're doing. Um, and I have to say that I'm in a minority because you saw the team composition. Usually mental health gets, um, uh, is not that uh, well regarded or is, it sometimes can be overlooked. 
Let me put it that way. So we have to kind of express what we do. They'll always say, what do you do? Um, cohesion was talked about earlier. Um, very important in the team because um, you actually basically could be surviving together. Um, we live basically in a tent that we put up in you know a few hours, maybe even one hour, um, and then we work in the tent and then also sleep sleep there as well. So we get to know each other pretty well, depending on the size of the disaster. Um, culture, again, is very important. You're working with other people, um, usually the people you know um, because they're part of your team, uh, but you may not have worked with them that, that closely. Linkages with the com with the community, I, this is the one thing I did want to say about the community, um, is that um, inter interventions employed after disaster must recognize survivors' strengths and resilience, assuming they are competent and help them to master the disaster experience. So affirming that we're strong, that they're strong and can, and can um, move on is really important. So connecting with the community is very important in that. So those are three micro areas, if you will. Those are the, um, the, the well, the, 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 the team members, the team leaders, and the, and the team itself, competencies that we've been digging up and putting together from the literature. Like I said, there's two other areas, there's several areas that we didn't cover, METSO and, um, and, uh, and the macro areas, which are also very important. So, like I said, all levels of the ecological model are important. Um, and significant progress at identifying individual competencies in the, in the general literature, but and there's some in the literature on disaster teams, but not enough. So this is why we're putting this all together. Now, all stages are important before deployment. At the micro level, we need tools to assess suitable responders um, and tools for assessing team performance in drills. We do a number of drills um, every year. We did one um, a few weeks, well, maybe about a month ago. We were part of that um, big disaster terrorist attack in Miami that you may have read about in the news. We were... Um, that happened on the beach and happened at the airport. It also happened at Miami uh, Baseball Stadium. So we were deployed there. We set up our tent, and the SWAT teams were all there, and they had all this stuff. But it was a way to get to sharpen our, our skills and be able to work with other teams. So multi-team group, uh, multi-team systems is another thing that we that's also very important in this process. Working with these other other systems that, that exist in their with their groups. Um, I'm sorry, uh, during deployment at the micro level, tools for rapid assessment of team processes. There are none that I know of. So I, I put up here a couple of measures that, I, that we dug up, a competency-based evaluation tool. This had nothing to do with disasters. It had to do with um, um, hospital groups. And so it asks a number of questions there and determines whether they're, they're ready to be um, uh, used or not. Um, on these situations. And another one I want to point out, this is the measure that I said I'm putting online, which is a, the ProQual that you may have heard about, but it's a well-regarded measure that, that looks at, um, it's a 30-item measure that looks at both compassion satisfaction and compassion fatigue. So it's not just negative, it's, it's positive and looks at strengths. I have a copy up here if anyone wants to look at it l later. So there are some examples of measures that, that could be adapted or developed further but we, we need to do them. That's why we're working on trying to develop these things. So disaster response teams are a necessity today. Um, and just because we haven't had a, a hurricane in Florida for a while <laughs> um, means we, you know, doesn't mean we should just kick back. This could be the year, as they always say. Uh, they operate in an ecology of human endeavor that occurs over time, which must be recognized in a model of disaster resilient team. Um, there's Limited empirically based guidelines to help leaders effectively staff and manage uh, teams. And so this is a, an effort at sort of building the literature on, on what we should be looking at. So here are my three last questions for you. How are you developing your personal disaster resilience and your families? How are you contributing to your team's resilience if you're at work? And how are you building your community's resilience because you're part of that team? So if you want to keep in touch about the research, there's my um, email, and I have cards I can give out at the end, but I'll show how we'll have some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGowan, for that talk. Uh, I think a few, a few things stick out to me 
uh, and I think there was a lot embedded in there uh, in, into your talk. One is that the mental health of team members is often overlooked, right? During a, when you as a group are serving other people, you often forget internally about that. And so that could be in the context of a disaster response, probably where it's more salient, but it doesn't have to be, right? That could be in the context of any team that is fulfilling a mission that is intensive, um, that especially serves other towards other people, you get drained, right? So being in a highly emotionally charged environment, seeing disasters, or just being in a highly stressful situation over a period of time drains the resources of of your team. And effective leaders recognize that, and they can sort of see how are my team members doing, particularly recognizing that certain situations cause for their resources to be depleted. And so how do you manage that to allow them to step back for a minute, to try and help recharge them uh, so that they can do their job effectively? And it's, it's certainly a core task of leadership, but one that we often kind of forget sometimes. And some people might have the opinion, you know what, they're just, they, you know, they can't handle it or, well, whatever. You know, they just, this is the job. Well, if some people are not, uh, may not have the resilience stock within them to be able to do the job effectively if you can't help buffer it in the first place or build it up, I guess, after the fact. And uh, I'm sure that's an area of expertise that Dr. McGowan could um, speak at and with and to for some length of time. So if anyone has any uh, I interest in that, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I I'm volunteering you to stay around for a little bit this, after this afternoon. So. <laughs> so we would now like to open it up for about 10 minutes of questions. Uh, and after which point we will be presenting the official trophy to Dr. Hahn for his dissertation award. So any, any questions for any of the uh, presenters? They could be broad questions or something specifically about uh, one of the talks. Uh, go ahead, the gentleman in the front. This man knows how to ask loaded questions. <laughs> <laughs> You mean pathology in terms of population or in terms of So I'll let Dr. McGowan take it. In general, you don't see pathologies just sort of come up uh, out of in, in a in a large swath of the of the population. I mean, there can be specific you know, there's sometimes there's some etiological causes that would show it to manifest itself suddenly, uh, but in terms of population uh, I think there's, a, there's some very interesting psychological research going back to how uh, we know several things about how people sort of deal with crises. Um, we also know that it's very easy to get normal people to do very weird things under the context of, of leadership, particularly during a crisis. So when there is a crisis, people tend to look to a charismatic, heroic leader to save the day. And so the influence and the possibility of a charismatic leader to emerge during the context of a crisis is dramatically increased because people want someone who can save them, right? So oftentimes the, 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 the most sort of significant historical examples of charismatic leaders have been the result of out and out of a crisis when people are looking for. So, and oftentimes when people are in a crisis and they see a charismatic leader, they sort of check their brain at the door 
and they'll say, okay, yeah, this is the person who's going to, and they sort of, they, they can remove some of that doubt. And so it can cause people to sort of do things they wouldn't normally do. And I don't mean in terms of just horrible things, but just in general, you see that uh, under the influence of a charismatic leader. But uh, Mark, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts in general. No, I think you said it well. I think then, and then contagion keep, you know, kicks in at that process, cultural contagion, I guess, and everyone kind of gets into that mindset that that, that that's the change we need and that's, a, and that's the person we need. But it's a little bit out of my expertise to talk about that sort of cultural phenomenon. So. Yeah, there's an interesting phenomenon in that most leadership scholars don't actually, don't get too involved in the realm of politics. And, and like, so they'll study it in any context because there's some things that apply, but so many things are so different uh, that uh, that you often find that. And it's sort of a, you know, I, I don't know if it's really fairly, or if it's justified, but you often find, I get very reluctant when people, so sometimes someone will say, hey, will you do an interview for this media outlet about politics? I'm like, I do no, I said, no, I, I do not want to talk about politics. Um, because there's so many things often wrapped up in it, and it's often for a particular purpose that, Someone in a media context is asking, uh, is asking a question. Yeah, but there, uh, there was a question over here uh, that we'll we'll move to next. No, I could not do that because the sample is from China, a uh, pretty homogeneous cultural area, and I could not collect any additional data from different cultural uh, contexts. So I think in part that uh, my uh, finding should be uh, interpreted pretty uh, with some caution because it is from particular cultural area. And that may explain, I think, uh, the reason why I could not find any uh, relationship between differentiation and envy because in that particular context, it is likely that they are more uh, receptive and accepting uh, whatever the leaders do because of the high power distance and because of that they did not try to challenge the leader's decision about allocating the resources. So yeah, I think there should be some <coughs> cultural consideration in my uh, in what I found, but unfortunately I could not collect additional data from different cultural contexts so that I could compare the findings, so, but that's a that really important consideration. Yeah. If I can follow up with that, do you think there'd be any differences if you did that study here? Uh, yes and no. Because yes, because admiration and envy are uh, primary emotions that you know all of us experience, no matter where we're from. But as I mentioned, because uh, I'm looking at the envy and admiration from the perspective of uh, uh, their uh, people's response to leaders and treatment the followers. Because of that, because uh, employees may have different you know uh, conceptions about. Uh, the, the desire, the ideal leadership style uh, across different cultures. So in this culture, I think it is possible that you know uh, it is okay and even you know appropriate for the leader to effectively differentiate. Then, if that's the case, as compared to more collectivistic culture where you know leaders treat you know uh, group members in a similar way. So if I could, if I were to uh, uh, have data from here, for example, then I might have seen a little bit different. Uh, Research because, uh, 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 especially uh, as for the relation between uh, differentiation and uh, envy, but uh, because in that cultural context, I think the uh, envy is considered sort of you know, negative emotions that we should stay away. Uh, versus, I don't know here, uh, more individualistic culture, then uh, it may be you know even not desire the encouraging, but okay to you know <laughs> uh, you know uh, envy uh, others and. Uh, uh, how can I say, uh, try to address uh, their feelings of envy in a more obvious way rather than try to suppress their feelings. So I don't know that. Again, I might have found uh, some different findings if I have data from here, but uh, I cannot you know, uh, uh, speak to the question any further because uh, I don't have any data. But yeah, that's, that's a really fair uh, consideration. Sure, in, in a blue shirt, and then I'll come to the back. opposite effect on high-performing individuals, that is, demotivate them uh, to the detriment of the group, and also do your findings differ depending on the size of the group? Yeah, uh, that's again a really good point. Uh, yeah, 
it seems like in the context of leader differentiating followers, uh, group incentives seem to be better because you know it can integrate uh, for higher co better coordination and higher performance. But as you mentioned, the group incentive may have downside as well because uh, in terms of the uh, the high performers, right? If they're high performer, then they might question why you know I get paid equally, even though I make more contribution, right? So uh, there's some downside of the group incentive as well, but I cannot. Uh, to that question directly because that's a little bit beyond the scope of, scope of my study. But uh, my finding is that the group incentive pay did not have uh, uh, the independent impact on the group coordination and performance. So my initial uh, thinking was that group incentive pay would be better for higher group performance, but not necessarily. And one reason would be uh, related to uh, your point. That because it may be bad, it may have some negative impact on high performance because you know, it may be demotivated then. As a result, there might be some positive paths leading to higher performance, but at the same time, it may have some negative paths, as you mentioned. So, on average, what I found in my study is that group incentive did not have independent and direct impact on group performance, only in conjunction with the leader uh, differentiation. There is a, and there's actually a literature on this looking at sort of what's the, we don't know what the right way is to, to uh, incentivize individual and group performance. It's usually a, mi a mix, right? So you wouldn't want all of one or the other. And it, um, I, we don't necessarily have great evidence for it, but one of the things you hear people say is it should be aligned with how much groupness is required of the group. Like there are some tasks that need to be done that really require the group to coordinate highly in a really significant way. And then you think of other contexts where, yeah, you're in a group or a team, but you all just have to do your part and then just put it together at the end. And if you think of this in the context of what student teams often do, they're not really a team. They say, let's divide this task into three parts. You do this, you do this, and then you get it. And it's three separate papers that happen to be at, at once, right? And so in, in that context, right, is that if the work requires a lot of groupness to get done, and in that student context, it doesn't, well, it would help if it were a little bit more, versus if the only way you can produce the product and get the thing done is by people collaborating in a, in a, to a significant degree, you need to reward group performance more because you're expecting more groupness and coordination out of them. Right, so there's something about the alignment there, and I think we don't have all of the our I's dotted and T's crossed in terms of what it is. Um, but uh, it, but your 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 point is very much that if you if you went all group performance, you could you know it dis it, it's an argument against you know unions, right? Is that everyone gets paid the same? You disincentivize really good performers because there's no incentive to perform well, uh, and and you do sometimes see that. So uh, question in the back, yeah. You mentioned uh, multi-learning, the phrase multi-learning following the multi-team systems. And I didn't recognize that phrase. I'm wondering, uh, aside from the obvious of learning within multiple teams, um, can you elaborate on that? Is that referring to sure. specialization going away or all of us to have multiple? Um, well, the term is multi-teaming that I discussed. And what I mean by that is people um, work on multiple teams at once. And I talked about how you can have access to knowledge um, across your multiple teams. And that's just, um, you know, when you're on a team, part of the reason why we put together a team is to get multiple heads to come to bear on a single problem. And so uh, through the information exchange that happens in a team, people are getting information and acquiring that knowledge. But then you also have access to knowledge from your teammates' multiple memberships because they're also in contact with different people and getting new information that they also transfer into their team. So it's a big learning process. Um, but what I was talking about was the phenomenon of participating in multiple teams at once, which is multi-teaming. I think 
Can I go first? <laughs> Uh, so the mix between delegation and group identity. Group identity. Say delegating to you, you, you understand? What do you mean in terms of delegating? Maybe that might that might. Well, what you were saying earlier, when, mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned how there has to be a modern amount of brand identity and. Yeah. So you want the group to be a a little bit cohesive, but not so cohesive that they shun outsiders and don't want to work with them. Yeah. So I think that's a tough question to answer because, um, you know, in a perfect world, we could probably put a number on it, but things are very dynamic. And so I think that's going to, we're not going to come to a perfect equilibrium or a perfect balancing point. In the um, research that I'm currently working on now, it's uh, being written up for publication. We did put a number on it, but we also put that disclaimer. And what we found really was that teams, uh, we looked at communication within teams and outside of teams in multi-team systems. And what we found is that teams do need to have high communication within their team in order to support their identity. Um, but then it's 50% is about the tipping point of external contacts uh, before you start becoming too integrated into the system and kind of start to lose the team's identity. Okay, and another question for you. How paramount is for the leader to set up the structure and not delegate it to whoever he well, that's part of setting up the structure, I think, is defining those roles and deciding, um, you know, here's how this is going to go. And at NASA, like I said, the leadership is rotating. So whoever is really, I mean, there's a commander, obviously, but, um, you know, they rely on the person who has the expertise for that particular task. So um, that's going to rotate. So that person's going to be setting the structure for the rest of the team because they know more than everybody else in that domain. But then, you know, that might rotate to somebody else. So it's important to set the structure, but part of that is, Delegating. What if what, Back, if what if leadership was a share? What if we thought stop thinking about it just in terms of a person, right? And started to think of it as a role that different people can it can enact at different points in time, depending on the needs of the situation. Uh, and because you often see that, right? That's why I get very scared of someone who says I'm I all I'm always the leader. I need to be the leader. It's, it's, I don't want to be on a team with you, <laughs> first of all, right? Because it, do, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and uh, uh, it, you, you can't always have such a rigid flow. And there's quite a significant amount of research recognizing this now, especially over the last 15 or so years, recognizing that there's this interplay and that we, we really have to stop thinking about leadership as the property of a person or as a thing that a person has. And to... to a set of roles that are enacted and can be enacted by different people even simultaneously. There doesn't just have to be one leader even at that one point in time. This doesn't mean you shouldn't have a hierarchy. People have said, oh, well, you still have to have a hierarchy. Yeah, absolutely, you do. But that doesn't mean that leadership is confined to hierarchy and formal positions. So, uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit uh, in the context of my research. So I have some thinking about, uh, which is similar to you, what the you know, ideal mix of individual incentive and group incentive, right? So many organizations use you know, hybrid uh, incentive pay where they pay both based upon individual and group performances. But what I found is that, interestingly, uh, the hybrid incentive system did not have a uh, significant uh, effect, meaning that if the uh, groups uh, receive, you know, hybrid incentive system, individual and group uh, incentives, their uh, the group members in those groups behaved pretty much in the same way as uh, the individual incentive condition. So it seems like uh, uh, if there's a two-portion individual and group portion, then their attention, although there's some group portion there, their attention tend to be more focused on still uh, individual ones. So the finding was pretty much the same as individual incentive condition. That, you know, uh, uh, occur, uh, that, uh, uh, Encourage me to think about again. The, the, uh, is there any the moderate level of you know uh, 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 group pay or uh, if I can? Uh, and I think this has some implication for you as well for your uh, question as well because um, according to my if I can uh, make some implication from my finding, I would say that there might be no such kind of you know moderate level of you know group you know groomness or group. Mm -hmm. If you know, two portions at the same time, they may, you know, the individual uh, portion becomes more uh, salient than significant. So they, you know, focus more on 
uh, you know, uh, based upon the individual identity, rather than although they have some, you know, uh, portion of group identity. But yeah, that's again beyond uh, the the scope of my study, so I cannot give you any further idea. But yeah, I have some similar uh, question, and I found some interesting findings. So our speakers will be around after uh, to take a, uh, a, any more questions that you may have. You can, uh, if you have questions or comments or ideas, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to chat with you. So thank you for those great questions. I'd now like to ask Dr. Myra Beers, Director of Strategy and Implementation at the Center, to join me up front for the presentation of the Dissertation Award for Dr. Han. So e each year, the, uh, we, uh, yeah, I'll come meet you up there. Yeah. So each year, the Alva Chapman Jr. Outstanding Dissertation Award is presented to honor an individual whose dissertation makes an outstanding contribution to the field of leadership. This is anywhere across the world, and we've had submissions from all over the world. Our 2015 recipient, Dr. Han, is no exception. As you heard, today his research is about how do we find this mix or what do we do to put up, to set up individual incentives versus group incentives, and how does that interact also with the way leaders treat people differently? Should they treat everyone the same? Or, but they often do treat people differently. And how can we mitigate that, how that might affect envy and admiration? So please join me today in recognizing Dr. Han on this prestigious accomplishment. Dr. Han. Thank you for coming today. It's, it never ceases to amaze us, uh, but in a really good way, how much engagement we get from the community to hear and listen to these uh, new ideas and new research. So thank you so much for being a part of this. We hope to see you again on April 12th. Next week, we have Harv Mogul, who is the president and CEO of United Way of Miami-Dade, and he will be coming to speak to us uh, and we, we're happy to tell you more information, but we're looking forward to that. So take care. Thank you. of Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.